Some of my students are asking me about anti-aliasing filters, so I'd like to do a problem on that. All right, when you're doing data acquisition, there's something called aliasing that you have to worry about. Let's say you're recording a sine wave. Okay. Just, I'm going to just have one cycle of this sine wave here. The question is, what is the fewest number of data points you can record and still be able to reproduce a sine wave? Now, you know that it's a sine wave, all right? and so you're just trying to reproduce it. And the reason you know it's a sine wave is that uh, if you look at time domain data in frequency domain, you go from, you use a Fourier transform, then uh, you can consider your time domain data just to, just to be uh, made up of a bunch of uh, sine waves, sine waves at different frequencies. You add all those up and you get the original wave. That's how we know we're trying to reproduce sine waves. So let's say we're trying to reproduce one. All we need to know is the amplitude and the frequency. Once you know amplitude and frequency, you know everything there is to know about a sine wave. Right? Well, let's say I recorded these two points right here on this wave, and the same two points on the ones that came ahead of it and the ones that came behind it. That would be enough to tell me how far apart the peaks were, because the next, the next cycle is going to come up here. Oh, that's terrible. The next cycle is going to come up there, and it's going to have a peak on it. And I also know what the amplitude is. Okay? Now, this is the best possible case. All right? So if I know these two points, I know everything there is to know, that means for a sine wave whose period is that long, I need to know two points for every period. That means the sample frequency, the number of samples per second I want to record, has to be greater than or equal to twice the maximum frequency I want to be able to reproduce, twice the, the maximum frequency of the sun, or the, the Sorry, twice the frequency of the highest frequency sine wave I'm trying to reproduce, okay? If you don't do that, something called aliasing occurs, okay? And let me see if I can draw this for you. Let's say that instead of recording those two points, I record this one. And let's see, the next one over here is going to be, let's see, over there, it's going to be out here somewhere. Well, now when I try to play connect the dots, I'm going to get a very different answer. Okay? I've lied to the computer, so it's going to lie back to me. The frequency I'm going to try to reconstruct is lower than the one that's really there. Okay? When, this is called aliasing. This is your, the, the, the thing you're trying to reconstruct, the signal you're trying, trying to re reproduce, looks like it has a lower frequency than it really has. Okay? You're getting the wrong frequency out of it now because you violated that rule. Now, when I say greater than or equal to, it would be really good if you used a lot more than two points per cycle. It makes things a lot easier. If I, if I uh, really oversample and do something like this, it's obvious. There's no way to mess this up. Okay, so how do I make sure that's true? I know what my sample rate's going to be. Say I set the sample rate to be 10,000 hertz, 10,000 samples per second. So once every point one seconds, the computer goes out to the data acquisition system, which is really just kind of like a voltmeter, and says, what voltage do you have? It sends back a voltage. Waits another .0001 seconds, and says, okay, what voltage you have? It records a voltage, and just writes all these down on the drive. Okay? That's pretty much what data acquisition systems do. There's other stuff, but that's the, that's the most fundamental uh, purpose of a data acquisition system. In fact, I'll pull it out here. Here's the smallest one I've seen. There's probably smaller ones now, but this is a little data acquisition box I bought. It's very inexpensive, and it's got these little uh, connectors on it, and power, it's powered off USB, okay? And so that's what this does. That's what lives inside that little box, and there's software that runs it. Okay, but let's say I set my sample frequency to 10,000 hertz, knowing that I don't, want it, I don't care about anything that's happening faster than 5,000 hertz. That doesn't mean the information's not there. It just means I don't care about it. So what am I going to do? How do I make sure that nothing higher than 5,000 hertz gets to my data acquisition system? Because if something with a higher frequency than that gets to my data acquisition system, I'm going to have a problem. I've then started to lie to my computer, and it's going to lie back to me. It doesn't love me. All right, so here's, here's what you do. You use something called a low-pass filter to avoid aliasing. Now, what a filter does is it just removes parts of a signal. 
And a signal, by the way, is a voltage. A signal is a time domain voltage that means something. It's got some kind of information encoded in it. Okay? I have my iPod over here somewhere. And there's a signal that comes out of the iPod, that wire that goes to the ear, earbuds. Okay? It's a time varying voltage that means something. The music is encoded in that time varying signal. Okay? So I've got a signal, and what I can do is I can, just like I can draw in uh, time domain, I can draw a signal in frequency domain, and I'll just put amplitude up there. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay? And any real signal, like if it's music or vibrations off an engine or something like that, is going to have some content in frequency domain. All right? When you go, from, you know, I live in time domain. I don't know about you. I live in time domain. I don't know how to live in anything but time domain. But that's not always how I want to look at my data. Sometimes I want to look at it in a frequency domain. And there are mathematical tools, a Fourier transform, or the, the, the thing that's usually implemented in software is a fast Fourier transform that goes from time domain to frequency domain. It's like changing money. If I change from euros to dollars, I'm changing from one type of money to another, but I've got the same buying power. Same kind of thing here. If I take time domain and transform it into frequency domain, I'm making it look different. I'm looking at it differently and maybe able to extract inf uh, meaning from it better. But I haven't added or, or uh, destroyed any information if I do it right. Okay? So let's just accept for now I can go into frequency domain. And let's say okay, fs over 2 is right there. Well, this stuff here, that's bad. That's going to cause aliasing. So what do I do? I can't remove it from the environment. You know, say I'm recording data off a car. You know, I've got an accelerometer on an engine. Well, the car really is, I mean, there really is content out here. But I have to stop it before it gets to my computer or I'm going to have aliasing. Well, I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to design a filter. I'm going to take a filter and I am going to make a filter. And I'm going to call this 1 right there. So it goes like that, and then drops off like that. Okay? So everything below this cutoff frequency is going to get multiplied by 1. Everything above that cutoff frequency is going to get multiplied by something less than 1. So what this will do, this has the, the effect of pretty much stomping that part of the signal flat, removing that part of the signal before it gets to the computer. That's what we want. Okay? So that's called a low-pass filter. And in this instance, the way I'm using it, it turns out that we're, we're going to call it an anti-aliasing filter. It is a low-pass filter that prevents aliasing. Okay, so there's the big idea. Now, how do, what, how, unless I can turn uh, crunch numbers out of this, I'm, this is just sort of prose right now, just sort of commentary. Let's see if we can, I'll show you how to implement one in a very simple circuit and how to calculate what that cutoff frequency is going to be. I have a little board here. Actually, like, I'm going to put it over here. Um, the simplest low-pass filter ever, and there are many ways to make low-pass filters, but this is the simplest one possible. Okay. Okay, that's input there. And that's output. Okay, so what we're looking at is we've just got a resistor and a capacitor hooked up this way. It's two elements. It couldn't get much simpler. There's no power going into it or anything. It's passive. So the input goes between those two uh, terminals, and the output goes between those two. Well, the thing I'm interested in, that cutoff frequency, or corner frequency, gets called both, is, hang on, in terms of, i to make sure I say this right, omega C is 1 over R C. Okay? Remember, omega is in radians per second. Well, I don't always want to work in radians per second. I might want to work in hertz. I, I, uh, I find that to be much more convenient. So there's what it looks like, 1 over 2 pi rc. That's where that is right there. Now, if you zoom in really close here, that's not really a hard angle. It's a, a curve that drops off slowly. And notice how that doesn't drop off perfectly. There's a lot of mathematical electronic reasons why that's not going to have an infinite slope. If you're curious, for a first order filter like that, that drops off. That slope is 20 dB per decade. And a decade is a factor of 10. Okay? Drops off pretty fast. 
Okay, and it can drop off a lot faster if you put these in series with each other. This is called a first order filter. You can go second, third, fourth, and all that does is that steepens that drop off. Okay, but there's the there's the cutoff frequency right there. Well, let's say let me let me erase this right here. Let's say I have some numbers to put in here. You can already tell it's going to be pretty straightforward, but let's go through the math here anyway. Let's say sample frequency is 10,000 hertz, okay, which is what I had before. That means every one ten thousandths of a second, the computer goes out, grabs a voltage off the data acquisition system, and stores it. In fact, instead of hertz, I'm going to actually write this out as samples per second. When you're looking at units, SA will be a sample. And that's actually kind of a convenient use unit to use. So F max is Fs over 2, and that's 5,000 hertz. Okay, that's, whoops, let me try that one more time. There. That's the highest frequency you can reproduce if you're sampling that fast. Well, we already know that making my corner frequency exactly that is kind of pushing it. So let's make my corner frequency, my cutoff frequency, 4,000 hertz. Okay? Well, 4,000 hertz equals 1 over 2 pi RC. Well, let's say I already know what the uh, capacitor is, or I'm sorry, the resistor. Let's say that is 10,000 ohms, or 10 kilo ohms, 10K resistor. Well, let's see. Let's push the capacitance up there. So the capacitance is going to be 1 over 2 pi R times the cutoff frequency. All I did was multiply through, sorry, multiply through by uh, C and divide by FC. So there's what I get. And if you work that out, let's see, this is, I guess I can work this out. 1 over 2 pi times 10,000 times uh, 4,000. All right. And I'm going to have to erase. How, how am I doing for frame? I can say, okay, I got it right there. I'll stay in the frame. C is going to be, if you work this out just in terms of capacitance, it's 3.979 times 10 to the minus 9 farad. Well, farad is an awful lot, so it's not unusual to see really little numbers like that. So that's going to be like about 4 picofarads, and that's 0 0.004 microfarads. So if you know those two numbers, now you know what the corner, you can uh, design a little filter that has the right cutoff frequency. Hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.